So this COP is absolutely essential for turning the Paris Agreement into something that is um, implementable. So in the UK, that's that the UK government starts delivering the carbon budgets in line with our net zero commitment, which is in line with Paris. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academia from all over the world and it will explore the hottest topics across the energy market. It'll be hosted by various experts from Aurora and will give a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm John Fedderson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora. And on the show today, I'll be speaking with one of the key shapers of British energy policy over the coming years as government pushes towards COP26 in Glasgow in 2021 and beyond that on the trajectory towards net zero emissions. My guest on the show is Emma Pinchbeck, incoming CEO of Energy UK. Welcome, Emma. Thank you for having me. And Emma's profile will be well known to listeners, but it's really been a meteoric rise, essentially since you left university. Um, I understand Emma was the first person in her family to get a degree. Uh, Less than a decade ago, she was editing the student uh, fashion columns for the Cherwell newspaper at Oxford. uh, And she was also involved in student politics uh, as a member of her junior common room community. Uh, After that, Uh, Among other roles, she went to the World Wildlife Fund and then was Deputy CEO at Renewables UK and recently has been appointed CEO of uh, perhaps the most influential uh, energy industry group in uh, the UK, Energy UK. So a remarkable rise in in probably less than a decade. I have a quick question, Emma, on on the background. Did, and this relates, I suppose, to you know, British, British politics and policy in general. Did your experience with student politics, uh, the newspaper, prepare you for your role in, in energy policy? Yeah, I think, I think in a couple of ways. One, I got to write um, about things I cared about. So, so actually, while I was on the student newspaper, I, I started writing about um, secondhand fashion and sustainability and using those columns to do recycled and borrowed clothing and and sustainability has always been something I'm interested in but that's the first time I kind of started to really think about what that would look like alongside other things I was interested in or cared about and I um, was really keen to try to make uh, sustainable living aspirational for want of a better word or kind of not the stereotype and that has stayed with me so if you see me at work or Mm -hmm. um, especially at work but out and about in general the kind of commitment to secondhand things and sustainability has held true all my clothes are from Oxfam including my wedding dress Um, and on the politics side do you know what I'd I was an odd fish at school you know I was very very square and and academic proudly so and I went to Oxford and discovered a a kind of whole social world and ways of exploring things I was interested in that I'd not had access to before and I loved it and and on the student politics I really kind of got to grips again with what I believed and what was interested in and different tribes and all of that stuff and that has been pretty useful for a career in Westminster um, I do, though, think that we, we, we desperately need more diversity of thought in politics and in the energy industry. So I am so proud to have been to Oxford. Um, I'm really proud that my background is unusual for having got there. But I really, I think perhaps we need uh, people that come with a different trajectory to say, you know, a university um, career in and out into a profession. So I'm really I think my experience was valuable. I don't think it's the only way or even the most valuable way to get to grips with the modern energy industry. Yeah, it's, I mean, I find it as an outsider in Australia coming, coming here for graduate education, it's sort of inexplicable. Yeah. Very, very hard to comprehend from the yeah, outside the how influential stuff. some of these organized yeah, institutions the, are. And the traditions and all of that. Yeah, it was a bit, I, I actually realized um, I became much more aware of class uh, at Oxbridge, but I never had, um, 
you know, the, the wonderful thing about the, the collegiate system that operates there is you do get thrown together with, with people from actually more of a diverse background than anyone would expect. Um, and my friendship group has held really firm since then. So that's another good legacy. I've got a really firm grounding of mates who really don't care about my career at all. And, um, and it's a very diverse group um, in terms of background, interests, careers they've gone on to. Um, you name it so I, I love that about it too and I would be loath to kind of reinforce the idea that Ox Oxford or Cambridge or an elite university education can't be friendly to people who who don't come from you know say a private school background or whatever but no. I yeah um it's it, it I think it would be good for the British public life for people in my sort of job to have even more of a of a interesting background than perhaps mine has been Mm, indeed. Um, can I ask you, just to get on to the job you've recently I think, been given, but you haven't started, just for the benefit of, of listeners, what does the head of an industry group do? Uh, you know, is industry group the right, the right term? That's what I tend to, tend to call them. What are the things that you do that really matter? Yeah, industry group is fair enough. Trade body, membership association, all that kind of thing. So, um, we're, we're, we serve a, a kind of group of paying members um, and what I have found interesting at, in terms of working in trade bodies is that the number one thing we do is offer a consensus based industry voice on issues facing a sector so in this case the energy industry um, and that's really important for you know politicians the public at any audience you can think of because rather than companies speaking with just their commercial interests as they have a right to do you get a kind of um broader view of what's going on in the sector and that can really help when you're setting policy um because you can find out where the say the middle ground on an opinion is or you can see where the general trajectory of travel is um so there's that kind of you know offering expertise and an insight into an industry in a way that is a bit removed from a commercial environment for officials um, to deal with and then the the other thing that's really interesting about it actually goes the other way is that you are in the middle between the industry and and policy makers in a highly regulated industry um, in a often politicized industry in an industry where you know the public innately have an interest because it's how we heat our homes and you know run our cars and all the rest of it um and the and a really well functioning trade body can help bridge that those those gaps so that we can explain to say a commercial director in a um, energy supplier why x y or z politician might be taking this decision on policy whatever the economic case you know there yeah. might be some other kind of political reason so you're kind of the interpreter between uh, a sector and and its audiences and it's a real privilege um to do that job um uh, yeah we also have a comms function too so there's a another bit about explaining to you know maybe public or other audiences third sector audiences and, and wider stakeholders what the industry is for so we're I don't know, um, translators, and I suppose as the CEO, yeah. I'm the translator in chief. Yeah, yeah, I'm explaining why the or the important role the energy the energy sector plays. Yeah. Do you think Do you think that role that sort of synthesis you sort of that that first purpose you described a sort of synthesis of of industry views and ex an explanation to government? Do you think that's more important now during COVID-19 and I you know in a sense government wants to crack on with certain things and so getting things moving you know getting everyone on the same page quickly is useful but at the same time I wonder if government just wants to get cracking with it you know with its own yeah. plans irrespective of what in you know irrespective of necessarily consultation that you might otherwise do so do you think COVID you know makes the role more important or, or, or less important in that sense? I think at times of stress for any um, economic sector having a trade body doing its job well is vital and this is stress you know the 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 energy transition is already underway and that's causing lots of change and upheaval in the industry we've got um and that's because of technology change but then also because of um the the, the pressure the needed pressure of decarbonization um and then on top of that we we're now dealing um with covid and the you know i've often described energy is a public good you know it's a it's a it's 
it, we require it to run the rest of the economy. So, so any change to the economy or how we leave obvious, live obviously really, really impacts the industry. Um, and yeah, my understanding is government has been talking much more to trade bodies and to the sector um, at this time. I think you're right, though, that at the same time as that, they're wanting to kind of crack on and get things done as government. And, and it obviously takes time for businesses to respond, work out what they need, you know, work out what their customers need and speak to government. And that is that's attention. But then again, that's the role of a trade body. That's why they're vital, because they can push and pull um, the stakeholders and, and, and their members as needed um, and hopefully support that, that dialogue. Yeah. Yeah, if I were to guess, I would say Energy UK are very enthusiastic about you. You starting full time pretty soon, given 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 yeah. the times we're we're, we're going yeah, through. Yeah. It is of course quite a different job to the one that I interviewed for last last year. You know, um, but that's uh, that's part of the attraction too. You know, for uh, you know any chief exec coming in either expects to be looking at operations and kind of the industry business as usual, or to be doing change and the reality mm. of my job is it's going to be both now um yeah. so yeah um i am really keen to start i'm actually i'm already doing a little bit of kind of getting to know everyone as you'd expect um, yeah that doesn't surprise surprise yeah. me so can, can you say a bit more how are you finding the transition and and i mean on top of the change of career you're becoming ceo of a, 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 what i think is an extremely powerful body uh, within within the energy sector you've also become a parent at the same at the same time or in recent history how's it all how's it all working out <laughs> i promise my husband will have a much quieter year next year because we also moved house um and, oh, wow. and bought our first home so it's been um yeah it's been a bit full-on i i suppose though that's the temperament of uh, that's my temperament in general um yeah i one of the reasons I took the job is it was a fantastic recruitment process that was very supportive of the fact that my daughter was two weeks old when I was interviewing, so I was sleeping approximately never. Um, and they have been a brilliant organisation at making sure that I could, you know, come on board flexibly and, and work around her um, and indeed will continue to support me to do that. And I thought that was such a attractive and and probably still quite unusual thing in the energy industry yeah to, great signal to the rest of the industry yeah and i'm conscious of that you'd have to be stupid not to be so you know and i um i have no problem that that is symbolic somehow and and i'm really pleased about it um and all credit to the to the board and the recruiters and so on so um that's been relatively straightforward there's a fantastic uh, team there and a deputy ceo in audrey gallagher who who have fought together admirably um, I have been very fortunate that I've loved my jobs. I loved um, the consulting firm I was at. I loved WWF. Um, I loved Renewable UK. And I, of course, miss my team, um, particularly as I've been on maternity leave. So I've been without work full stop. Uh, and that bit of it is hard. But I really fundamentally believe in what energy uk does and will be doing uh, for the energy transition going forward so i am really excited actually to get going now yeah it's a, as i said at the start it's a critical time right you know COP, i mean there's, there's COVID 19 there's there's glasgow cop next year and then there's how you know the, the the emissions trading scheme to be introduced doesn't yet have net zero as its as its target there's all sorts of things to do there do you think so, and I also talk about how remarkably young you are for the role. Do, do you think now is kind of a time for young people in energy in the sense that knowledge of how things worked 20 years ago isn't, isn't particularly helpful for how it works now or how it's going to work in the, in the, in the future? It's both. I know that's a, that's, that's not a, you know, particularly compelling answer, but, but, um, no, I'm interested. You, you need, I, I think, the skill sets we need so on what we need today i would be pretty hopeless if i didn't have didn't get to sit alongside people that have been working in the industry for 20 years and, and had some you know some foresight that hindsight has gifted them as to what happens when there's a big energy transition and you know how the engineering might work and what might go wrong with the physics that as a as a kind of optimist pushing for change i might not envisage i think i think that opinion and experience is really valuable however i do think that 
it is a really unprecedented time for change and and most people got wrong the speed with which the system could change and a little bit of um speed energy uh, enthusiasm for new ideas is needed right now especially with the urgency of climate action um on on my relative youth um, it frequently comes up at my performance reviews that I'm quite energetic, so maybe I get a Substance. maybe I get an advantage there. Um, yeah. And I and I do I do value again I value having young teams with new ideas and some of the 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 best people I've worked with who've kind of kind of come in and seen what needs to be done and and been the ones to really drive a change have been young grads who who have a real passion for what they're doing. Um, and so that was a long way of saying i think it's both you know the yeah. best teams are a mix of both um yeah and i hope that my appointment again is a signal that the industry recognizes that yeah and it's interesting that on the grad point i mean i'm struck with you know, aurora aurora does a lot of recruiting we're 125 people so and the amount of this country and other countries talent that is focusing on the energy transition, I think yeah. is, rem is remarkable in general. And compared they are to 10 or 20 years ago. Just... Terrifying. Yeah, they are terrifying, like brilliantly terrifying, the yeah. next generation. They are, you know, if, I always say that to people, actually, if they're scared by me and the speed with which I operate, they should meet, you know, it's not for me necessarily that I'm like that. It's, it's because I feel responsible to the 24 year olds that work for me who want things even faster. You know, yeah. they're just, they are impatient for change and, um you know it's their their electricity and energy system their world that that we're responsible for in some ways so you know you've got to respect that view um a small anecdote when we were recruiting for uh, at uh, in my previous organization we were recruiting for a, a kind of director role and a grad role at the same time and just as a, this is a huge generalization, but for the director role, we got fewer applications as you'd expect, but they were also much less diverse, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Whereas our graduate um, internship, we were just like, you know, fighting off yeah. like n hundreds of qualified applicants who were, who came from amazingly different backgrounds, who were all fantastic. It was yeah. it was so much more difficult to recruit for intern positions than it because because of the talent yeah. that's out there. Um, and um, a, a further segue to say, don't forget that the energy industry isn't what it used to be. It's not a kind of siloed system anymore with a unique set of skills that only our sector wants. We're going to be in competition for those graduates and those skills from a whole range of industries now who want the same thing. Yeah. Um, who want STEM graduates, you know, from the IT giants through to the finance industry, because everyone is un undergoing a degree of digitalization and decentralization. So that's worth bearing in mind, too, when we think about the future and we think about who we're hiring and what talent looks like and what skills we need. It's it, We need to have the kind of workplaces that speak to those people. Yeah. Because it, it's it's not it's not just our bit of the economy that's that's facing change yeah it is that a bit of the uh, you know that ability to couple it with the social purpose that a lot of people see with yeah. um in, in climate change and the energy transition that i think you know sometimes tips the balance i had a chris hunt from riverstone who's an investor on it was interesting he um recently and he was reflecting on bp and we were talking about Beyond Petroleum, their campaign from a couple of decades ago. And it, it didn't work out very well for BP, but he said that the light bulb went on when uh, he was there at a recruiting fair in 2006 mm. and uh, all recruiting within BP and everyone wanted to be in the new energies business, yeah. even though it was this horrible, you know, performing horribly, <laughs> you know, it was a tiny fraction of the business. And that yeah. was, that was a sort of light bulb moment. And I think you know, in the last, the intervening 10 or 15 years it's gotten stronger and uh, yeah definitely and it and and it the, obviously climate change is the issue that people want to work on obviously and that's that's the same for me i'm i get out of bed in the morning to do something about decarbonization you know um i that that is it for me that's yeah. i go to roles where i think there's an opportunity to say something interesting or do something different and energy uk is certainly one of those but um the it's it's not just that the the graduates of the future are also wanting things like you know 
diversity in their leadership and they want better work life yeah. balance and they they're kind of they they and they they just want that um, something back for everything they're going to be carrying for us, I suppose. And yeah. they're intolerant about it in a good way. <laughs> and I, all of that stuff we need to kind of get a, get a grip on as well. I think as an industry, we just need to be, we need to be a better industry in general than what went before, which isn't to in any way diss retired engineers who probably know a lot more about grid physics than I do and did a really good job of keeping the lights on. It's just a different yeah, world now. It's, ev it's evolving. Yeah. I, I'd like to get a bit of a sense of how you're going to think about the, the, the new role. So I've got a, a few questions about the energy sector more broadly. The, the first one I have is looking back, and I know you, you, know, you, were, in, you were in high school for some of this period, but um, <laughs> over the last couple of decades, what do you think have been the three best policies in the UK energy industry? Okay, these are uh, possibly a bit niche, but let's go. Well, actually, one of them isn't. So I'm trying not to be a like walking stereotype here, but I'm going to have to for the first two, which is, um, in my experience, the ones that have been game changing are the Climate Change Act in the UK. Yeah. Um, and um, contracts for difference. Um, and the reason for that, uh, the reasons for that are as follows. For the, for the Climate Change Act, when I was at WWF, whenever we were working with foreign delegations, so in the run up to the Paris Agreement or just in general in that kind of massive global network, we were, the UK office was most frequently asked about the Climate Change Act um, because it was seen as an incredibly successful bit of governance. Now, there are lots of issues with the Climate Change Act, you know, it could do with more teeth. There's all that debate about whether the targets need to move forward. For me personally, I'm not actually a massive fan of long term targets if there's not like a real effort on short term action. But as a piece of legislation, it, it's brilliant. There were only four votes against it. The, the invention of the CCC as an independent body is, is a work of art. Frankly, they could do with more powers. The, um, tying of, of a long-term target with recommendations every five years that fit in with a parliamentary term so that a government has a very clear job was was also really clever you know there's loads about the yeah. climate change act which is which is brilliant and that then drove a whole load of policy that we're seeing the fruits or not of now um which brings me to cfds so um i I left WWF because I was looking at the renewables market and I thought, uh, and, and renewables in general, and I and we were wrestling, had been wrestling with how we communicated the success of decarbonisation policy to, to governments um, and, and to the public. And I thought that there would be this moment if renewables prices dropped as low as we all in the NGO world thought they could, because we were walking optimists. Um, mm. and but you were right. Yeah, we were yeah. right. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, but everyone thought we, I mean, people thought we were mad, but, yeah. but that optimistic view was right. Um, and I thought, having had then a campaigns background, I was really conscious that for the industry, trying to make something of that moment when it happened could change the game for how we think about decarbonisation and that kind of upfront investment. And it was a massive, massive privilege to be representing large-scale renewables when the CFD auctions came back and, and to have been part of that journey to kind of really low prices. Um, and in my role at Renewable UK, I was on the kind of front line of watching industry go through auction cycles and um, that, that competitive environment really drove innovation. Um, and we, we've been left with an industry that is so cheap relative to where we thought we would be at this point that it's been remarkable i think so and it has changed game for the entire industry um, yeah. so the cfd um what what we do with it now going forward i think and, and energy markets in general i think is now a, a source of really fruitful debate because if you've got you know in the uk if your energy markets are dominated by a pretty much subsidy free variable source of energy generation that's uh, that that kind of fundamentally changes market values in my mind just a thought so yeah yeah well i may and i may try and pick that one up later as i think yeah. as, as we talk about some of your priorities moving moving forward okay. i think it's it's been a it's been a live topic of uh, of recent episodes of the podcast so very keen good to 
Um, people are probably much more informed than me, given that I've been nine months out on where we are with that. <laughs> but yes. Um, and the last one is, um, and it, it's a policy that was dropped, um, but uh, heat and energy efficiency are going to be the battlegrounds for decarbonisation going forward. Um, they're also so important in the UK for things like fuel poverty and vulnerable consumers. And I cannot believe that we scrapped standards on new build homes because that's a that is a no-brainer retrofit is by far the biggest challenge obviously but you do the easy things first on decarbonization mm -hmm. and i thought the old green building standards were actually very clever in that it would work the same way as the the kind of climate change act it gradually tightened over time um and i we desperately need a replacement policy for um heat decarbonization and energy efficiency and again I think you start with the easy stuff. So, um, you know, taking another look at the building regs for me would be would be up there. Why, why has it been so hard? Do you think? Because I, I, you know, when I and again, I'm I focus more on electricity. But when I look at heat in the UK, I say that you know, no policy has really, you know, achieve, achieved widespread decarbonisation in, yeah. in the country. I mean, the um, European regs in 2005, I think it was, you know, did something, um, but but not much has happened since then. Dealing with energy efficient heat is really difficult because it sits in the kind of Venn diagram of being very personal and, and feeling difficult um, and uh, because it's our homes and, and, um, and, and that makes governments nervous um, and it's difficult to do for lots of reasons, kind of public commission is harder in that space. Um, secondly, because there are you know, there are challenges with getting the, the economics right. So the technology, some technologies on the heat side are, are still not mass market. So we need to get them to mass market. So the costs come down, so they're comparable with the fossil fuel equivalent, et cetera. Um, that will probably require policy intervention, which then takes you back to, well, governments are nervous about that because it means doing things to people's homes. And then lastly, in, in the UK in particular, but by no means just in the UK, we talk about the energy customer as if they're just one customer, but we've got in reality, lots of different types of energy customers, you know, rural, urban, vulnerable, fuel poor, elderly, young, <laughs> rental, um, you know, home owning. And we have to find policy that, that delivers to all of those kinds of households, plus the commercial sector. So it's quite, it's complicated to get it right yeah. if you're an official. Um, and then the last thing I always think with this stuff is it's just a bit boring. I'm going to get hate mail from energy efficiency manufacturers yeah, okay, now. Yeah. But it's not like an electric vehicle or something. No, or you know, solar yeah. on the roof. I swear to you that EVs and solar PV have partly done well because they're kind of sexy technology. And when I talk yeah. to the public, they often want to talk to me about windmills. Or, um, oh, wow, I'm going to get into trouble with IUK now. Wind, uh, wind turbines. Um, they want to talk about electric vehicles. They want to talk about batteries, you know, all of that kind of kit. And they should, that we need all of that stuff. But you try having an interesting conversation about loft insulation, mm. um, because I have tried. Um, <laughs> and, and I think there's something there, you know, we need to kind of try and get some comms attention onto all of that as well. So, yeah. you know. Do you, do you see parallels to fuel excise as well? I mean, that's one of those things that seems sort of stubborn, stubborn and you just don't touch it as a politician um as well yeah i mean uh, any policy area you can think of where there's an overlap with with um our day-to-day -day lives in a very tangible way yeah is going to be trickier than doing something at system level and by the way that is one of the reasons that i work on um system change and and work in uh, and have worked in the power sector for so long is that it's it's bigger levers um, when we're dealing with a with the climate crisis, and I really believe in system change. And it's often easier than trying to get, you know, globally seven billion people to say change change the way they live. It also, you know, misdirects where the problem is. So, you know, it's hard to blame government for that kind of thinking. But but over the next decade, we are going to need for governments to be braver. And I think it is the job of industry and the trade bodies and third sector to to try to help them um engage with the public about some of this stuff no. maybe okay so a slight slight change to sort of drill into your agenda at energy uk yeah. let's just say let, let's just imagine cop 26 is wrapped up 
Uh, so whenever that is, sometime in the sometime I think in the middle of next year, um, or towards the end of next year, I think. What what will have happened between now and then for you to have regarded this period of period of British energy policy as a success from now until that point? Well, I don't want to second guess the team that have been doing all of the work um, and know what they're talking about. So by no means is this Energy UK's view of the world, this is mine. But um, just off the top of my head, things I know are coming. We've got the Energy White Paper coming. Um, that is going to have to do two jobs now. It's probably going to have to engage with the impact of COVID on the industry and make sure that we've, we, you know, that everyone is in a position to then deal with the energy transition, which is the second thing. And the, and the thing that we expected to see from government, which is some engagement with the changing markets, um, you know, some engagement with with what I call EMR and retail market 2.0, yeah. um, that recognises some of this change in values and, and some of the direction of travel and helps us go further. Um, and then in you asked about COP26, and for the UK government, I think it's really important that that goes well. Um, you know, we want to be on the international stage doing a good job and um, cops are looked at and actually the UK's um, because of the climate change act the UK success in decarbonisation to date is is viewed with respect internationally so there is an opportunity um, for the UK to really shine if it does that well. Um, for COP26 outcomes you'd have to go and ask the NGOs, I think, for a, mm -hmm. a really detailed take, but but it, we are supposed to be seeing countries actually coming up with plans that match their commitments from Paris. So this COP is absolutely essential for turning the Paris Agreement into something that is um, implementable. So in the UK, that's that the UK government starts delivering the carbon budgets in line with our net zero commitment, which is in line with Paris. Yeah, I mean, on that Paris point and, and in implementing policies that get us there. So, so I'm told that to hit the Paris two degree target, we need to be net zero globally by about 2070, 28 is what the scientists say. Uh, and I think a lot of Europe say, well, we're a bit wealthier than everyone else. So, so maybe we should aim for 2050. And we're seeing that sort of legislation enacted around, around Europe, including in this country. When do you think the UK will hit net zero emissions will we do it in 2050 or, or before or after yeah i'm really uninterested in in talking about long-term targets is that massively controversial i i we need to do it by 2050 i think if that's what the ccc are advising there is a really valid question that is difficult for us all to discuss because of things like accounting and technology availability about what um an equitable response to climate change looks like given mm. that industrialized nations have been merrily burning fossil fuels for much longer than many countries that are now trying to develop you know so there's a kind of there's a conversation to be had somewhere that people are uncomfortable with about whether we're doing enough and should go faster but my job is um has been dealing with the technological and industrial reality i suppose and mm -hmm. This, and Chris Stark of the CCC says this often, which is that, you know, the fastest they think that we can decarbonize as it stands is 2050. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that that date can't come forward and, and, and maybe it will. For me, though, as I said, I, we spend a lot of time talking about that date and nowhere near enough time trying to make loft insulation sexy. Yeah. Let's crack on with it. It's a, there's enough yeah. to be done no matter what year We've it is. We've been talking about heat yeah. decarbonisation for as long as I've been working, which admittedly is previously discussed as not as long as some people, but it's long enough. Um, and I feel aged um, despite my relative youth. So yeah. I'd, just like, I'd like to see us crack on and do some of the stuff right in front of our noses because then I think the date comes closer anyway. Yeah. And at the moment, we're not delivering whatever the date is so so that's that's where my focus always is yeah it's a really interesting point i, I remember back in my acad academic career when i was doing my phd it was sort of there was another study of the social the optimal social cost of carb and someone came up with 400 bucks someone yeah. came up with 200 bucks and there were academic debates about what the right methodology was and i was sort yeah. of you would say well you know it, it, it doesn't really matter who's right um you know we, there's a long way to go from where we are now anyway 
Yeah. Um, so interesting to do that. What's your view then on private sector targets? You know, we had BP saying 2050, we've got RWEs uh, tar- targeting these types of things. And of course, you know, the de- definitions are an issue. But do you think that's useful from an aspirational perspective to, 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 to name a target 20, 30 years out, you know, beyond the, beyond the tenure of the current board and CEO? Uh, yes, in that it's a sign of where the market's going. The fact that companies of all kinds now feel that they have to have a net zero target is a real sign of, you know, this idea that the Overton window has shifted, you know, that this is yeah. something that everyone realises is important. I mean, quite a few of us realised it was important before, but, you know, like it's, it's a, it's quite exciting to see that and for it to be mainstreamed in that way. Um, again, though, um, I've done a lot, a lot of work with companies and, and company boards in my job at WWF and, and occasionally since where we've looked at sustainability targets and, and what we always used to say to companies in that NGO job um, was you want to make sure your targets are science based. Um, And you want to make sure that they are actually about absolute carbon reductions, you know, that that they're not just kind of carry on business as usual. Um, uh, And I don't know, maybe hope to offset. It's it's got to be actually concrete emissions reduction. Um, So, yeah, again, it's it's probably a similar line of thinking to how I feel about long term targets versus, you know, kind of implementation today, which is that the proof is in the pudding. Um, yeah. And there, and some of those net zero commitments are astonishingly impressive with the change that that is being driven through businesses because of them. Some of them are more about saying that they want to be part of this movement, and they ha- and those companies haven't yet got on board. Um, I'm hoping very much none of them are greenwashing, but I couldn't. I haven't. I, I genuinely um, do not know. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Okay, good. So to, I like to conclude the show with a couple of questions of sort of underrated, overrated questions to get you yeah. to, to form a, a form, form a sort of view rather than sitting on the fence on, on, a, on a few issues in the energy transition. So just a couple of these. The first is uh, the role of government in spurring innovation. Do you think that's obviously there have been some great successes? I don't mm. think many people would say government hasn't played a big role in, in spurring innovation. But do you think government's role is overrated or underrated here? Underrated. Am I supposed to tell you why? No, well, you, well, okay, yeah, why not? In a couple of sentences, that'd, that'd be great. Uh, um, underrated uh, because we, if government invests, quite often the country keeps the broader economic benefit of that innovation. So we get more back than than yep. uh, we realise. And the CFD is another good example of that. You know, we've got we've got British supply chains coming. We've got a really cheap industry. It happened much faster than the private sector would have done it alone. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, second one is uh, car. So final one: carbon pricing as a means of decarbonisation. Uh, you've talked about alternative instruments and and you didn't mention the carbon price you mentioned the cfd is sort of a key key policy yeah. success of the last couple of decades do you think carbon pricing is overrated or underrated do you know it's it's d- definitions are key here right so mm-hmm. um carbon pricing is so important and and staying part of the ets um you know has been is is really important following brexit that's clear coal phase out for example happened not just because of you know renewables prices falling and because of public pressure the the carbon price made a real difference to that when i Absolutely. when you look at the numbers so yeah. it's it has been very important i think we're worry of carbon taxes and i'm very wary of carbon pricing instead of policy intervention uh-huh. so so generally my number one philosophy when it comes to the carbonization is it's it's pretty much all of the above we need it's not private sector or public sector it's not um, individual action versus system change and it's not carbon pricing versus you know um, regulation at, at, the, at the stage that we're at it's all of the above it's like every tool in the box yeah yeah interesting and there's a lot we could pick into uh, there as well mm-hmm. but I, I'll conclude the show there so um, thanks so much for engaging in the in the conversation it was great to hear about your trajectory to the role that you're about to embark on uh, I suspect it is inspirational to, inspirational to a number of people Emma Pinchbeck incoming CEO of Energy UK thank you so much for joining me
Thank you. And as an illustration about what, what being a, a working mum is like, I now have to go and wipe hummus off my child. So, <laughs> it could know. be worse based yeah, on my Yeah, meteoric rise, so. but very, very humbling to be at home right now. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, have a good evening. Thank you very much. That was John Federson, co-founder and chief executive of Aurora, speaking to Emma Pinchbeck, incoming CEO of Energy UK. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.